Rokan 23. That's right. It is here. It's not back. It's here. It's the first one. Join the ultimate celebration of digital content with its creators, passionate fans, and industry experts. It is all happening in downtown Waco across multiple venues, January 20th through the 22nd of 2023. Now, if you want to go, you got to get tickets, and tickets are on sale at roguecon23.com. That's roguecon, R-O-G-U-E-C-O-N 23.com. Be there. I'm going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. Let's go. Hey, y'all. I'm April. And I'm Caroline. And this is your bloody happy hour. Caroline, are you ready for this? This is your newest guilty pleasure. It's the bloodiest part of your week. Did we say something about it also being happy hour? Showed in. Because we're about to be sipping on some murder. Bloody happy hour. Hey y'all, this is April. Hey, it's Caroline. This is Thursday. Thursday. On Tuesday? It is Thursday. What is today? It is Thursday. You confused me. I tried to. She tried to and she did. We have a special guest in the studio and they, he is actually with us and not on the phone. Live in person. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Matt Cawthon. I'm retired Texas Ranger. That is not a baseball player. Just so you, in case you, I know. I'm the other one. I really think I'm I'm funny. the poor one. The more, the more important one. Caroline would be the only one to think that. No, I just, I'm special. I have special qualities. So that's the only thing. Yeah. So Caroline and Matt are newest, bestest friends. We are. We're best friends as of like a whole week. Fist bump. Fist bump. They got a special handshake <laughs> and everything. So Caroline invited him on. He was a big part of the Matt Baker case. So I'm going to let Caroline. Well, so the big part that, well, we talked about it, but obviously you were involved in it. But as far as. Tell us first of all your your career. How long had you have you been? I mean, you're retired from it now, but as far as Texas Rangers, how long were you a part of that? Well, I of course I began my law enforcement career in the Texas Department of Public Safety as a highway patrolman, and then I went into intelligence, criminal intelligence. And back in the '90s, criminal intelligence did a lot of uh, oh uh, gathering in, in information about crime syndicates uh working a lot of vice type crimes i did that for three years and then promoted again into the texas rangers where i spent the next 17 years now that's 17 years of being an actual ranger doing investigations i was never a, a ranking officer i was never an administrator i was always in the field working so are you basically Chuck Norris? I am basically Chuck Norris. Okay, that's what I gathered. I'm not even as old as Chuck Norris. Oh, man, I, I knew you were impressive. <laughs> okay, so as far as we had, we talked about you for the Matt Baker case, mm -hmm. and so Hewitt Police Department was involved in the case, kind of, sort of, not really. <laughs> How did they go about involving Texas Rangers? How do you get involved? How do you get or you, your group get pulled into it? And what was your role? Well, first of all, let, let's talk about Carrie and her mother, Linda Doolin. Yes. Linda Doolin, a very courageous woman, very tenacious in, in her belief that her daughter did not kill herself. She had every reason in the world to live. And um, she could not get the satisfaction she needed. So she actually uh, contacted uh, some friends of mine who were all former law enforcement and uh, I had worked with them in the past <clears throat> on several different cases. And uh, they, they, they began helping her by, by doing a lot of the legwork, a lot of, the, of what just looked like good circumstantial evidence. And every time they turned over another leaf, there was another clue and another affirmation that Carrie did not kill herself. Wow. And so then at that point, they're like, <clears throat> hey, friend, we know that you can pull some strings that we can't, or? Well, what, what happens in these cases when private citizens or private investigators in this case, um, they get to a certain point, and, and when this becomes more than just a civil matter, more than just a, you know, a, a, a 
what to what is normal for private investigators, they really can use the help of law enforcement. But what do they do when law enforcement doesn't listen to them? They contact the Texas Rangers. Okay. So is okay. In let's, how does the Texas Rangers rank? Is there like you know? I, I think of um, the hierarchy. Yeah, the hi- like Are I'm you thinking the of principal over the police. No, <laughs> where th- I think of this as um, <clears throat> if I'm thinking of like South Carolina because I I was thinking the uh, Murdoch cases and I was like this their sled sled out- so is outstanding that outstanding organization is I've that with them. It, okay so would sled is sled of South Carolina as Texas Rangers you know as is. Of it, Texas, it, kind it of? is a similar comparison. Okay, uh, Sled does. <clears throat> they are state policemen, who they, but but they may even have in South Carolina original jurisdiction. The the Rangers, um, we do our best work when we're helping other agencies, because let's let's take a uh, let's take a little town out in West Texas. They may not have a murder for 20, 30 years, and then all of a sudden they have something that's uh, what kind of what we call a whodunit murder. Let's take Ooh. Missy Beavers mm-hmm. as their case. Yeah, yeah. I'm not familiar with that one, <gasps> but I'd be glad to listen. But but w- when you don't have that type of, of, of crime, you cannot get good at it as a local investigator, right. as a local detective. So, so when you call in the Texas Rangers... Um, First of all, it's free. I mean, we, we are state employees. We are, we are there to help. That's what our job is. It doesn't cost the agency a thing. We bring to bear all the resources of the state of Texas, from their laboratories to their uh, analytical services mm-hmm. to the uh, manpower, everything from, from aircraft to, to, to uh, you know, dive teams. and you know, Anything that we have, we can we can bring it into one in one case. <clears throat> so it should be a positive thing, but do you get resistance a lot? I, I get resist. I got resistance a lot, and and it's not unusual because uh, egos. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just let's just sum it oh, up in, yeah. uh, you know, police. Police can have um, can be very territorial at times. Yeah. And so, but that's that's where the value of a Texas Ranger comes in because, you know. You, uh, a ranger may have to work with a p- police chief and a sheriff, and they may hate each other. But the but the ranger has to come in, and he has to walk this line and still get the job done. Mm-hmm. Wow. Hmm. Um, I, I know I'm shocking you when no, I tell you, yeah, to tell you no. that police have egos. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Actually, um, Detective Terry Fuller, I know the Terry. cold case, came uh-huh. to my book club uh-huh. about two weeks ago. And he said the same thing, but on the cold case side. So if there's a cold case and they come and take it over as the cold case unit, the police department has to give up everything and basically like pull back. And police departments are a lot of times resistant to do that. It's not working together. It's not like a collaborative type thing. It's totally given up. And so sometimes the police departments don't want to do that as well. The last three years of my ranger career, I was a cold case investigator. That's okay. all I did. Now, I, I will tell you that in that short period of time before I retired, we were just going after the low-hanging fruit, the, the, the actual agencies that actually called us and said, we need help. We have a case. We have, you know, we, we, we're stuck. We need a fresh set of eyes on this thing. And that's great. But when you have... Uh, when territorialism, you know, b- becomes problematic, then then then, then that's where uh, law enforcement gets stalled. Okay, okay. This might be dumb, but if you're if they, if it's cold and the local agency is not working on it, why would they be so like don't work? Because on it. if they get it and they solve it. Well, then it should. makes the police department look bad. Like you've had it this whole time. Why didn't you solve it? Well, let's let's Ego. also let's also also not be so hard on local police because every day that a detective in a police department, let's say a big city police department, comes to work, he's got another stack of cases from the night mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. And if he has a cold case sitting over here, and he has all these cases. It's it's hard for them to, to balance this. Oh yeah, and there's just so many hours in a day that they can work. So so I, I'm I'm never hard on these guys, and I, I always try to come in and just let them know, hey, we're here to help. We're not taking this away from you, 
And if we have a, some success, you and your chief or you and your sheriff can stand up in front of the cameras and you can, you can you know, say what you want to say, thank us if you want to thank us, or right. if you don't. The Rangers never step in and, and try to take the spotlight. Okay. <coughs> nice, nice, nice. Love it. Um, do you know, do you keep in touch or know how the, uh, going back to the Doolins, like, are they still in town or are they? Well, yeah. And I, I don't know where Linda lives, but uh, coincidentally, in today's edition of the Waco Tribune Herald, she wrote a very nice letter to the editor about me today. Wow. And y'all are. Y'all are welcome to look at it. Wow, we will. <laughs> Y'all go check that out in the Waco Trib. Oh, hey, that's Perfect awesome. Timing. Cool. What else? Which one's next? <clears throat> Gentry? Sure. Okay. I don't know much about this. Just, can you just tell us? Okay, these are just, this is another big Waco case. Yeah. It's come up recently, like. Why is it? Why you said is it something in the about news right now? Some people from True TV were, came to you about it recently, and then we had another p person do the podcast here. They were talking about it with a CNN, a lady from CNN. Mm -hmm. So it seems to have come up recently. For some reason, these um, um, true crime type television shows uh, about women who kill mm -hmm. and my, is kind of a special niche of uh, of, of, of investigative type shows and that's what happened here um a very sad case <clears throat> but we uh, again we were assisting a local police agency the the uh, robinson, robinson police great guys over there they, they 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 check their egos at the door and we check ours and we all work together and this is one of the one of the a stellar example of what police can do when they work together okay. I, i'll tell you about a part of that one of the detectives for the uh, Robinson Police Department, Mike Noel, hardworking, smart young man. And uh, he, uh, Darlene Gentry was a nurse. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, the investigation um, uh, revealed that she had murdered her husband. She was convicted for, of that. But one of the things she did is that the shell casing from the, from the, the, the weapon, she put on a, a surgical glove. Now, think about how a nurse picks up something uh, that she doesn't want to touch or he doesn't want to touch. They pick it up, they turn their glove inside out, and drop it in the trash. Mm -hmm. So in this case, that's what happened. She put it in the kitchen trash, but before she did, she poured a whole pan of hamburger helper to cover it up. And Mike, whose job Mike had to do Mike, that, <laughs> he Mike, got hungry. <laughs> Mike dug through the the muck and and he found this very oh, key wow. piece of evidence. Wow! Because when we sent the, uh, of course, then we had a shell casing, a twenty two caliber shell casing, and what we had then had it was inside a glove that was turned inside out, and so on. Now on the outside of the glove was fingerprints, DNA, DNA, DNA. And wow. that was uh, now. That, do you have you had to have the gun to match it to it, right? Well, now we didn't have it at that point. Mm -hmm. So she tried to buy land in on um, in kind of near Axel, yeah. Okay. And it had land. She wanted like a pond or something, right? It had a pond on. It. Had a pond on it. She wanted it drained. Well, she said she, she told the, the the landowner, my husband before he died, he always wanted our children to have a place to fish. Yeah. You know, and the landowner says, it's it's for sale, lady. You know, it's not, I, he probably said it's not on sale, but it is for sale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were going to work out a deal. And at some point later, she comes back to him and says, I still want the land, but I want you to fill in that tank, that pond. Oh, yeah, with dirt, like with dirt. Who does that? Nobody in no, Texas. Nobody does not. Yeah. The ponds are like, um, like gold in Texas, you know, in, in a drought. And so. It, it it just didn't make sense even to the landowner. So he came to law enforcement and said, "Hey, you know that lady that was arrested for DTF for uh, <laughs> yeah for <laughs> killing her husband? She wants to buy my property. She wanted a pond, and now she says she wants it filled in. And and you know, little light bulbs are going over our heads. Going, that's a clue. E wow. <laughs> and even he said, "You reckon she threw something in that pond?" I said, "Well." 
I happen to know where a dive team is and we can find out. Wow. So they didn't even have to put on their dive gear. They just waded out into the pond and they found a pristine 22 caliber uh, <laughs> pistol. Hadn't been there very long. Uh -huh. And so now, again, this sounds simple, but it was not that simple because I, we ran into resistance from the district attorney's office because they said, she's been arrested. She has an attorney. We can't uh, communicate with her. I said, okay. Well, she communicated with, with the landowner. She wants that pond filled in. And I, I think I'm going to tell the landowner to tell her that he'll be glad to do it for her, but, but he doesn't want to get his bulldozer stuck, so he's going to drain the pond for her. Okay. Put a pump in it and drain it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And then we didn't, we didn't ask for any information from her. We did ask for any incriminating statements. Um, she already knew what her rights were. She was going about her business. So he told her, and we waited. And, and we didn't have to wait very long. And there was game cameras or something up yes, there? Yes, well, yeah. I, I had set up um, a video camera, uh -huh. and, um, and I was waiting on her to get there. And, of course, we had surveillance units out on the road, and we knew it when she came, and we knew when she was walking down the path to, towards the pond. And then I simply hit play, and there she is uh, groping around <laughs> in this pond for, a, for the pistol she threw in there. Wow. Which they already had. And, the, and we already had it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She couldn't find it. She put, <laughs> she put on rubber boots. And oh, I vaguely remember she, I'm that fly video. Fishing. I don't know. <laughs> no. She was she was kind of a young and pretty girl at the time, and kind of a Barbie doll looking uh -huh. girl. And and um, of course, we never. She never confessed to her crime. But we we believe that it was all over money and um, like insurance insurance policy okay. she wanted she wanted a, a different lifestyle a better lifestyle although by many standards she had a very nice uh, right. uh existence she had a nice house a nice husband and beautiful children and uh and, and a nice part of robinson okay hmm. um this is kind of off but a little bit on mm -hmm. if you see an upside down pineapple what do you think i've heard this somewhere <laughs> i've heard this <laughs> It means something. <laughs> so it means supposedly that whoever has that are swingers. So I say that because there was a rumor in town that the gentries and a bunch of their Robinson friends were actually part of like the swinger district or neighborhood in Robinson. Do you remember any of that coming up during the case? Well, Caroline, did you did you ever see them at the meetings? Or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've talked about swingers clubs. I don't have another person to swing with, so I just... She swings said, alone. I just swing alone. Rokond 23. That's right. It is here. It's not back. It's here. It's the first one. Join the ultimate celebration of digital content with its creators, passionate fans, and industry experts. It is all happening in downtown Waco across multiple venues, January 20th through the 22nd, of 2023. Now, if you want to go, you got to get tickets, and tickets are on sale at roguecon23.com. That's roguecon, R O G U E C O N 23.com. Be there. I'm going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. Let's go. Hi, I'm Hank. You might remember me from a show called King of the Hill. Check out Ma, a King of the Hill rewatch podcast. These boys ain't right, but they are funny. Find the Ma podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. I tell you what. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know uh, about all that. And, and you know, I, I really... I hate to even talk about things like that because mm -hmm. we don't know, and uh, speculating is is only going to hurt the family even uh -huh. more. The family's having to live with, with what's going on. The loss, yeah, the loss of their father. Now the loss of their mother, who's in prison. Hopefully until oh, until goodness. she, until the hearse backs up to the to the loading ramp and takes her out. And there was an appeal in 2020, or she tried, right, but was denied. Yes. You think she'll ever get out? No. No. 
I think didn't Matt Baker have a try to he tried to in twenty twenty two in twenty twenty really yeah it, apparently denied. his request for appeal was denied good so wow these are sad cases um, yeah. you know Carrie ba- Carrie Baker's death was senseless mm-hmm. um, Mr Gentry's case was was senseless uh, you know there are other answers we don't have to kill our spouses you know divorce you know they they could have um, you know don't just just it just and you don't think it happens in our little bubbles here in Waco Texas we all live in little bubbles mm-hmm. and it's never going to happen to me and um and it, and it won't until it does right right keep your head on a swivel I want to we yeah we always say don't trust anybody <laughs> true don't trust anybody um that's what they say in politics too <laughs> oh my gosh I can only imagine and now a word from our sponsors uh wait do you want to tell your story about the case that you were talking about yeah it's just well this this was another very sad case in in that has far-reaching tentacles beyond way beyond waco and uh this involved a young man named Gary Patterson who had uh, been through a nasty divorce with his wife, uh, Chris, uh, the wife, I can't remember. It's not the TCU coach. No. Um, okay. Or the former. No, no, no okay. different, different Patterson. <laughs> Gary Patterson was just a hardworking young man here in town, and he had a beautiful six-year-old girl named Crystal. And um, his wife uh, was, I, I, sometimes I, I, I entitled this as married to the mob. Uh, Gary Patterson was married to the mob on this thing, and his he always suspected his father-in-law was some sort of bad guy. Um, but as this thing unfolded, we we find out just how bad he was. He was a he was an operative, not a not a card carrying CIA operative, but uh, probably along the lines of a once or twice removed informant for the CIA back in the 1980s. Wow! And what we learned was is that. The father-in-law is named Sam Urich, and he's he's also in prison for the rest of his life. He um, <clears throat> he back in the 1980s, he was uh, when he was kind of high roll in it. He was involved in the uh, theft of uh, about 2,000 pounds of uh, C4 explosives that belonged to the U.S. government, and they smuggled it out of the port of Houston to Libya. And uh, the Libyan government then used parts of this of these explosives to commit acts of terrorism against U.S. soldiers overseas, including the bombing of a disco in uh, Berlin, Germany. And uh, and because of this uh, this act of terrorism, President Reagan ordered airstrikes on Libya. Oh wow! So we were in you oh, know, this. Wow. This is in, like an international oh, incident. My. Yeah. All related back to Sam Urick, and. Right. And their um, their operatives, their their friends, their colleagues, their uh, that they were working with at the time. Now, fast forward back into the two thousands. Okay. Um, we were involved in this uh, custody uh, uh, thing with with, uh, with Sam's daughter, and it even got to the point where uh, Sam and the daughter and the mother, um, uh, you know. Uh, the, the grandmother of the little girl had they had um, uh, uh, in, in interfered with child custody. Gary had custody of the child, and they had snatched her and taken her. Gary had them arrested, and you know all that was you know was was playing out. And when this happened, Sam Urich said, "You know what? I'm taking care of this guy," and he did. He uh, he went down to uh, Honduras. And he found one of his old um, running buddies down there. Okay. And he, uh, according to now, now this fellow ended up confessing to me. Um, and he said that when Sam Urich tells you to do something, you don't cross him or he'll kill you. Wow. So he came to the United States. He came to Texas. And he stayed at the uh, Red Roof Inn. And um, and he would go to Gary's work. And um, and he would go by taxi. Now in Waco, Texas, back in this time, <laughs> mm-hmm. 
who not many people went in taxis everywhere they went, right? And so, but he had been to Gary's office so many times that he had then decided that, hey, listen, uh, uh, he, he would call the office and say, hey, and give a different name every time. But the, but the, the receptionist recognized his voice. And his name was um, Ted, by the way. Okay. So Ted would, um, would call up there and ask for Gary using a different name. And it kind of got it to be a joke that around the office that, uh, that hey, Gary, the guy who doesn't want me to know who he is is on the line for you. And where did Gary work then? Uh, a place called Brazos Environmental, which they do uh, site surveys for, you know, neighborhoods okay. and things like that, okay. you know, for building neighborhoods. And so uh, what Ted did, Ted told him that, hey, listen, I like you, and, 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 and my boss is going to like you. W- would you consider moving to El, uh, to El Paso? We're going to do a lot of work in El Paso. Would you consider moving out here? And it will give you a pay raise and a new Suburban. And by the way, here's a one-way ticket. If you want to come out and interview with us, here's a one-way ticket. Mm. And if we like you, we'll give you that suburban to drive back in. Gary thought about it. He even told his parents, said, I don't know about this. This looks, seems a little shady, a little sketchy. Oh, he felt and it. He felt it. and But he went anyway because it was just too good to pass up for him and Crystal, uh, the future of his daughter. So they went out there, and, they, and Ted picked him up at the airport, and we were able to uh, – these people are – are creatures of a habit. He stayed at the Red Roof Inn out there too. And, and funny thing about the Red Roof Inn, if you pay cash, Ooh. they want they want your driver's license, and they, they put put a copy of your, of your driver's license in the file folder. So we knew exactly oh, who Ted was. Good. He had a South Carolina driver's license. He was wanted by the federal government for a fraud case out in the Carolinas. So we knew who we were looking for, and then. When, when Gary didn't come back from El Paso, we went to El Paso a lot of times, and we found where Ted was staying at the Red Roof Inn out there on the same time that Gary. I mean, it was all falling yeah. in place. He wasn't even a very good. So we got to the point where the federal prosecutor, Bill Johnson, said, we got enough to get a, a, um, a warrant for Ted Yurk for the murder of Gary Patterson. But it's not enough. It's enough for a warrant, but not enough for a conviction. And he said, Matt, you have to go to Honduras and find this guy. Oh, hell. You know, the, the, the guy lured him out there. Ted, he had already gone back to Honduras. He was uh-huh. living down there. And uh, I said, well, and I'm skipping over some of this, but it's, yeah. it's, it would take too long. So I said, why? I'm not going to Honduras. He said, you have to go. And I said, oh. I so... Myself and my my supervisor, Ranger supervisor, uh, Cleet Buckaloo, we all we loaded up and we got on an airplane and we flew to Honduras. Okay. And so what we did when we got there is we met with the um, the U.S. Embassy personnel there, and they and we were assigned two really courageous Secret Service agents. You know, Secret Service they work counterfeiting in all parts of Latin uh, Latin America and Central America. So we're working with these two CIA a agents. I'm sorry. Working with these two Secret Service agents, we um, we got with Interpol police from Honduras. Now, Interpol sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? I've heard it on Criminal Minds. You've heard it on, <laughs> yeah. You've heard it on James Bond films. Well, it's true. There is an Interpol. Mm-hmm. In this case, it was about eight armed um, uh, Hondurans with, with machine guns right in the back of a pickup truck. And that was Interpol, all okay. right? Oh, my gosh. But, a movie. <laughs> yeah, this was like a movie. But um, they, were, they were good. Now, Honduras is a country about the size of Texas, and we were looking for a white guy, uh, an American, mm. with gray hair. And so we flew into the capital city of San Pe- I'm, I'm sorry, of Tegucigalpa. Okay. And, and it is an a, 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 um, airport between two mountains. And they have to corkscrew the landing, but they could because they can't approach it. Oh, oh my! And when and when they land, everybody applauds and <laughs> oh, because at, they're still alive. <laughs> and you look out the window at the airplanes oh that gosh. didn't make it. They just push them off to the <gasps> oh, side. Oh and my goodness! Is this like the main Honduras? Yes. This is the capital <laughs> city. The capital city of of Honduras. So we we got lucky with a few things in the fact that. Um, 
that we 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 knew um, we had a phone number that Ted was using, right, from Honduras, and and in Honduras back in those days, if you the, the if you if you own a house or rent a house, the phone the phone number stays with the house. If you leave, that phone number stays. Uh, so we were able to track down the location of the house that Ted had lived in. He doesn't live there anymore. That he and his wife. Uh, we learned had moved down to the uh, coastal area of, of of Honduras in a place called San Pedro Sula, another large town. Mm-hmm. So we get in this bulletproof van and with the embassy and with the uh, Honduran Interpol police and pick up in front of us, yeah. and we drive down this mountain to the beach, basically. Now, now down here, we we had heard that he was working in some sort of uh, automotive repair shop. So we, we were checking out all the automotive repair shops with the Honduran uh, Interpol police. And as we drove past this gate with this tall fence, I saw a glimpse of what I believed was a white man. White, gray-haired. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so the, oh, the Interpol police set up surveillance, and, and the next day we caught him. And it was, it was Ted. And... Um, Ted believed that me and the other ranger were a couple of U.S. Marshals there to arrest him on his fraud charges. Mm. And I sat there across the table like I am with you in this, in this barracks of a, uh, of a police station. And, um, <clears throat> and he started in on this thing about the fraud and this and that, and I'm just shaking my head going, Ted, I'm not here about your fraud. I don't care about your fraud. Here's why I'm here. You came to Waco. You went to the Red Roof Inn. You went. You got in a taxi. You went and talked to uh, Gary Patterson. You gave him a one-way ticket. You met him in El Paso. You took him out into the desert, and you murdered him with, uh, with Ted Urich. And he said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I, I did some of that, but I didn't do all of that. I said, you tell me what happened. And I just kind of beat him up with facts. Uh. And he, he finally said, listen, I... I am not going to take the fall for Ted Yurk because I told, finally told him, I said, I've got a better case against you than I do Ted, uh, uh, Yurik. Sam Yurik, uh-huh. the father-in-law. He said, I'm not going to take the fall for Sam. Here's what happened. And he laid it all out, self-serving as it was. He says he took him out into the desert uh, after he was drunk. He pulled out a 22 pistol and held it on him while Sam tied him up. And Sam told... Um, Ted. So Sam was there. Sam was there in okay. the desert. Yeah. Okay. In fact, he had uh, uh, Ted had told Gary that hey, we got to go out into the desert to get some soil samples, and then we're going to meet with the CEO. What? Uh, Gary never left the desert. Oh and, uh, God. So um, we then took um, we had to go meet with the uh, the cabinet level um, person in charge of immigration. And what we finally worked out a deal that, that this guy was an American citizen. He was undesirable. They deported him. And they said, I said, where are you going to deport him? We're going to get him out of here. I said, well, can we have him? And they said, sure. <laughs> so wow. so, so now, now in, the, in the country of Honduras, the local media was accusing us of kidnapping him. Oh, okay. So we put him on an airplane, and we got him out of there as fast as we could. We, uh, we flew to Houston and drove back to Waco with... Ted Young, the uh, the the accomplice, mm-hmm. and um, we already had we already had Sam in custody. We uh, the U.S. Marshals had arrested him in, okay. in Las Vegas, and so all this was put together. But before we left Honduras, uh, Ted drew me a very crude map of where they buried that body mm-hmm. in the desert, and uh, two Waco police detectives and some uh, immigration officials, uh, customs guys were. Uh, I faxed it to them. They looked at it, and they said, well, it's not much to go on. But they went out into the desert, and they were looking around in the desert and, and just just studying the land. And there's cactus and yucca, mm-hmm. and, you, and picture El Paso sand yeah. dunes. But over on this one sand dune was a dead cactus. And they said, that's out of place. Oh. <gasps> Let's start digging right there. Wow. And that's where he was. The, the cactus they had uprooted and put on top of his grave as kind of a, a kind of a, a last F you, you know. Yeah, oh my gosh. Oh my what was the gosh. timeline? Like when oh, he went missing and then twenty two months. Wow. Yeah, we stayed on that thing for a while. Wow, wow, wow. 
made it seem it was like like a Law and Order SVU commercial. I just felt like episode. I was like watching an episode. I know, like you solved it so quick within the You're hour. You're gonna have to come back and tell another story <laughs> <laughs> within the hour. Well, I tell people that you know, a we don't catch the smart ones; we only catch the dumb ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, he was real dumb. They were both real dumb. This was kind of one of those things where uh, I, I I jokingly said that um, I, this, this reference may be a little too old for y'all, but. Um, Terrorists came to Mayberry, and um, Andy and Barney caught them. She's pretty old, so she could know. <laughs> I know it. My mom used to watch it. What a what what a what an evil bunch, though. Well, yeah, and he was the thing is his gut was telling him poor Gary his whole time. The whole time he knew his father in law wasn't good. He probably had a gut about his wife before he married and had a kid with her, and then his gut was telling him not that this d- didn't seem legit and, and he it, still, but then that's that he just had that trust. He had a better heart than all of them did. And all of Sam's kinfolk from his wife to his daughter to others, they knew what he was doing and he, he told them what he was doing. Wow. And, um, and now, now the ex-wife, did she uh, get some time? she got some time, but she, huh. she's now dead. She died of, of cancer. Okay. Uh, her mother, she's also dead. Okay. Died of something. Well, and it. Sam is still in prison. He's in a um, in a federal supermax prison. He'll, he'll never get out. And Ted? Ted? Ted got 15 years, and he okay. was not happy about that. Okay. Um, and then where did Crystal go? Crystal is uh, al- uh, she's alive and well. She's married and happy. Um, uh, she ended up living with uh, her pater- paternal grandparents um, and yeah, uh, Gary's mom and Oh, dad. Gary. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Good. they raised her, and it's uh, sad, but it 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 turned out to be uh, probably the uh, as good as it could be. Okay. Um, and Crystal is a, is a. I haven't seen her in years, but um, I was invited to her wedding a couple of years ago. Oh wow! Yeah. He it really is Chuck Norris. He is it's Chuck Norris. <laughs> I've got nothing on Chuck Norris. Can you tell him really quick what you? Th- thought all these years with the Texas Ranger Museum here was? Oh, I thought the Texas Ranger Museum was about the Texas Ranger baseball. But, you know what? (laughs) That's fine. I realized maybe that's why I didn't recognize anybody on those walls. (laughs) She was like, I guess I just didn't know any of those players. This must be the oldest baseball player in the world. Listen, I've we used to, uh, I've been in there so many times. I'm like I, I just didn't think I was just like I didn't know it was like. <sighs> I will I say this though: every case, every every case that I could come in here and talk to y'all about, it's not something I did by myself. It's it's always a collaborative effort because uh, everybody pitches in on these things, mm-hmm. and um, uh, law enforcement works best when they work together. Five minutes, okay. Um, we appreciate it so much. If you could tell us, I know you brought up the Gary case. We brought up Matt. We brought up Darlene. Is there another one that still sits with you that maybe is unsolved, like one of your cold cases that <sighs> kind of might keep you up at night? You know, I, I I don't have any that keep me up at night. Um, we have one for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, one a cold case that I that I recall and and that you may even remember uh, happened a few years ago, maybe ten or more years ago now, but it was the uh, the animal control officer in Belmead who was murdered oh, on duty. Uh-huh. That case turned cold, and uh, when I when I started looking into it, uh-huh. and um, his uh, his name is Bobby Evans, and Bobby was a uh, he was a, he was their animal control guy, dog catcher, mm-hmm. and he was murdered at the at the animal shelter okay. when he went to open up the door and feed the animals for the day. Some uh, meth tweakers were out in the bushes and they were looking for anhydrous oh. ammonia that someone took out there and and delivered to for them. In their whacked out minds, they saw a a man in uniform. And they believed he was police. He was unarmed. And uh, they came up behind him and killed him right in the doorway of the animal shelter. Wow. Um, you better be careful. You're about to be living out there. <laughs> this was, it was kind of interesting because uh, back then, Bellmead didn't have a real animal shelter. They had, a, uh, they had the old concession stand at the abandoned ball fields. And so they had turned the concession <laughs> stand right. into their <laughs> an animal shelter. Uh-huh. And so he had come out there. 
to feed the animals and bless his heart. He, you know, he, it was just tragic. Wow. It's, again, senseless crimes and that we think can never happen to us. Mm-hmm. But um, So do they get sober and tell the story? No. Well, what I ended up doing was uh, finding, a, um, you know, one of the more distasteful parts of this job is having to work with uh, criminal informants. Okay. And uh, I ended up developing an informant who uh, got us some information that, that kind of helped it unfold. Wow. Kind of like a Leonardo DiCaprio? No. Or what? <laughs> Like the Everything's Departed? A oh, like on The Departed. Oh, yeah. Okay, before we go, wh- I want you to tell us what what you're running for, what's going on in your life right now before we wrap this up, and how what can we do to help? Well, I, I am, I've been retired for a few years now, and um, I, you know, once you have the servant's heart, as they call it, it's, it's hard to stop it. The, um, an opening came up for a constable in Precinct 4, and, uh, uh, I, I would almost venture to say that nobody in this room besides me even knows what a constable does, and that's okay. No, you're the president What's, of the police. The president of the police. <laughs> what what it really boils down to, and, and to me, is that there are two elected law enforcement positions. The rest of them take orders from whomever, the governor or the police chief or whoever, and that is the the, the sheriff and the constable are um, elected. Elected, okay. And so that means that that they work for you. And if and and there should be a relationship with your constable that if you have problems that are not being addressed or if you have a problem that you think uh, is best suited for uh, the constable or if you just want a little special attention on something, you know, you should feel free to contact your constable. But you can't do that if your constable doesn't have the experience and leadership to handle it. OK. And the, the, the mundane job of a constable is to serve civil court papers. They go around knocking on doors, not going to businesses and serving papers. Very mundane, but that's not all that they could do. But they have to have the experience and the leadership to do that. And and I have I have a vision to make the office more professional and um and and maybe even more efficient um in, in their work schedule. I, I don't think that in in this area of McLean County that there's enough work to keep a constable busy all day long. So I have other ideas, and I'll give you an example of that is there is a rampant problem out there with uh, scams against the elderly. Oh, wow. Our parents, our grandparents are getting, mm-hmm. our, you know, people are calling them, and they're, get, and they're losing their life Money? savings. Yeah. yeah. And I want, I want an outreach on that. I want to be able to, uh, to go around to the senior centers and to the churches and, and maybe put on a presentation for these elderly people, what, what I call the greatest generation, and then give them the tools they need to, to, you know, to, to resist the, uh, the, the silver tongue of, of the scammers out there. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So we have to bring you back. Um, we appreciate you so much for coming on. I'm so glad you and Caroline are new best friends. Well, I'm pretty I'm, much. I'm glad y'all invited me. Thank you very much. We're, Maybe next time my voice won't be so raspy. Mine well, is like that all the time. It's okay. I'm perfect, so it's you great. Are, you is are there perfect. somewhere that everybody, our listeners need to go to to like your page or follow you? or? You can go to, to votematcawthon.com, okay. and you can read about me. I have a Facebook page, too, uh, for Vote Matt Cawthon. And um, learn a little bit about me. I've, 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 I've got a lot of, of, um, of experience. I've got a lot of, uh, of years in training, and, and I'd like to, to, to continue my service to the citizens of McLean County. And what's Precinct 4? What area? Precinct 4, uh, if you think of uh, Moody, McGregor, Crawford, China Spring, okay. Bosqueville, Spiegelville. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. We well, love it. We're so glad to have you on. And when does the election start? Early vo- early voting starts this coming Monday, oh. val- Valentine's Day. Okay. And uh, the actual election day is March 1st. Okay. So it's All almost right. over. Love Y'all, it. thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to. Chuck Norris's tears cured cancer. Too bad he never cried. <laughs> <laughs> Stay aware. Stay alive. And always be DTF. Like Matt Cawthon. Bye. Have a good one.
This has been a Rogue Media Podcast. Join the ultimate celebration of digital content with its creators, passionate fans, and industry experts. It's all happening in downtown Waco across multiple venues on January 20th through the 22nd, 2023. Tickets are on sale now at roguecon23.com. Hi, I'm Hank. You might remember me from a show called King of the Hill. Check out Ma, a King of the Hill rewatch podcast. These boys ain't right, but they are funny. Find the Ma podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. I tell you what, <laughs> hmm.